Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 11, 2021, and this is the week in charts. I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending or watching on YouTube. Thank you for that. So what are we talking about? Well, I think the market is pretty much the show. There's some things on trading psychology you want to talk about and a little bit of a little bit about options. But we'll get to that. Uh, your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them to the slides just to keep my ADD from kicking in. And we'll get to the live charts. You can ask about anything you want. And we can always go back to the slides. And I do have some extra slides in here tonight in case there's some certain questions that do come up after the presentations. Uh, stock picks, if you don't mind, wait till we get to the live charts too. That's for your benefit to make sure they don't get lost in the Q&A. And also ask about one stock at a time. So I wanna just kind of touch upon trading psychology a little bit tonight based on what's happened to me recently, based on what happened to me last year, and then based on what I see some of you guys going through. And believe me, we all go through it. And then I'm gonna touch upon options, just a couple little simple things with options for you to think about when it comes to the trading. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then, amen. So today my back started hurting. I got this little knot in the back of my back and I haven't had that feeling in 30 years and or 25 years or however long it's been. And I remember when I first got that feeling, I was working at a job that I, that I hated. And, and you know, my first day on the job, it's like the boss pulls me in and he says, uh, you know, you're going to be manager over these people. And this person's a really problem, real problem. And, you know, congratulations, here you go. And then it's like, oh, great. Now I had to deal with that. And then I inherited, I don't know how many lines, maybe 10,000 lines. I don't know. I don't even know how you count anymore of programming from somebody else. And the program didn't work. And then it was my job to make the program work, deal with some personnel issues and all. And if you've ever coded before, even if you your own code, okay, I go in and look at stuff that I did on a website a year ago, two years ago, or even six months ago, or three months ago, or two weeks ago. And I have a hard time trying to figure out what's going on. And then so I was dealing with this guy's code. And I remember we'd have meetings six months in and they'd be like, you know, you know, Andy left a long time ago. Why are you talking about Andy? And it's like, well, you know, he left me this big pile of crap and he went off to be a dentist. So he didn't care much about programming, I'm, I'm guessing. But anyway, long story endless. My back hasn't hurt since it hurt like then. Back then, one of the most stressful times of my life. I, I thought I had a tumor or something, seriously, back then, because there's this one little bitty knot in there. You know, it was crazy. But today my back started hurting again, you know. And it kind of reminded me of Soros and uh, Warren Buffett. They talk about how they start having these bodily aches and pains, and you probably need to pay attention to them. Now, the one thing great about COVID, if there's something great about COVID, is it's kind of changed my attitude towards trading in, in certain ways. And this is the first time that I was under that stress. And then, of course, the reason I was under that stress was I have – a position in GME, uh, probably a bad idea, you know. <laughs> but I've been doing a certain thing every week, and it's been working every week, and I, and I have a feeling it's going to be one of those that'll work until it don't. And it's no secret I've just been buying these incredibly expensive puts, and then been buying stock against the puts when the stock begins to rally. Buy the put, stock sells off. I got the put if the stock begins to rally, which it has almost in every case so far. I go long the stock. And, you know, when it runs a couple hundred points overnight, I cash out the stock. And in an ideal world, I would sit on that put and then ride the put down. And, and a couple of times, like uh, last time I did it last week, the damn uh, the damn stock imploded. It dropped like 50 points. You know, put would have been 50 points, 100 points in the money, whatever. Anyway, long story endless. My back sort of hurt today. And it made me realize a couple of things. I started thinking about some of the things that... Douglas says, and, and you start getting into Douglas, and it, there's so much good stuff from him. There's stress in trading, duh, big duh there, right? But if there's excessive stress, you are shooting from the hip or have a half baked plan at best, or you haven't accepted the risk. So if you go in, and, and by the way, one thing that I that I want to flesh out a little bit is I a while back was like, why don't traders plan their trade? Why don't traders use stop? And the reason is 
the moment you plan your trade and, and put that stop in or plan for a stop is the moment you have to realize that you could be wrong. And we don't really like being wrong as human beings. And in trading, as you probably know, you're going to be wrong a lot. So as soon as you put that plan into place, you have to honor that stop and admit that you may be wrong. Now, as I've said many times before, it's it's not completely stress-free, don't get me wrong, but it's a hell of a lot easier to follow my trading service than a lot of the trades that I put on outside of the trading service, some of the, some of which are usually on the Landry list. And then occasionally there's like uh, S&P futures and things like LabD, LabU, SOCSS, and all these, these other things. And the reason those other trades and other stocks and all is because I don't have that full plan going in. When I look at the the service portfolio and i'm able to uh it's kind of a cool feature you could you could set watch lists when you look at your 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 equity to show you where your your um where the where the for instance the service i can have a watch list just for the service for day trading i always know by looking at this screen exactly how much money i've made on the day trade now i know i preach against day trading i'm talking about intra day trading and by the way one thing that i talked a little bit about last week with the COVID is i'm a little bit more flippant which i'm going to talk about in just a few minutes uh, the word flippant that is and, and being flippant in your trading but i've learned to trade my trade the volatility of the stock the instrument versus trading my risk tolerance okay so if i go into riot or something like that that's setting up and bitcoin's rallying or whatever and I want to go in and do an intraday trade on Riot. Well, Riot's probably going to take four or five points. So what I'll do is I'll adjust my share size down to where I'm only trading maybe a couple hundred shares per 100K. And you know what? I can live with that. And believe it or not, and this is why I talk about intraday trading and preach against day trading, is that I'll put in an order. And if it triggers, I'll put in a stop for half and I'll put in a limit for half. Let's say I'm long 400 shares of Riot. I'll have a limit to sell 200 shares, let's say four points below the market, then I'll have a limit to sell 200 shares, four points above the market. And there's been quite a few days with some of these, I've been kind of bearish, so like uh, SOCSS and LabD and stuff like that. But there's been quite a few days lately where I've reduced my share size down, I'm not staring at that stupid screen all day, and that that trailing stop just trails higher and when i hear a little zing at the limit not all the time obviously but if i hear a little zing at the limit then i know that there's nothing to do with that trade till the end of the day i get an alarm and i exit now of course if you're trading gme it's a complete different ball game and it sort of consumes your life and i and i got that little knot back in my back so i'm gonna have to pay attention to that and be cognizant of what's going on the point I'm trying to make, and believe it or not, I have one because I wanted to start. So I wanted to talk a little bit about trading psychology tonight. And every time I go to talk about trading psychology, I don't want to come across like I'm holier than thou. I have stress in my trades, obviously. Now there are some things that are kind of stress-free. It's like this COVID thing again, kind of opened my eyes. It's like Dave, you don't have to be plowing in these huge share sizes. You could just trade a few hundred shares. And to my amazement, I, and, and not every day, believe me, because if it was, you'd never see my fat ass again. But I had one account where I was trading like 200 and 400 share size day trades and not making a lot of trades. You know, I, I forget exactly what I was long, probably Lab D and Sox S and uh, Riot and Myra. And I'll be darned if at the end of the day, I did I made $3,200, I think. And I can go back and check the trades and I'll show you. I'll show you the exact trades I made in this one account. And that was just trading a very small share size with the most risk was like 0.4% on that. So if there's stress, if there's excessive stress, there's something wrong, you're either shooting from the hip or you don't have a plan or, or shooting from the hip and don't have a plan or you haven't accepted the risk. And I certainly haven't accepted the risk and the GME trades, and maybe I need to stop <laughs> trading GME, but it's just, it's so hard when you get that gamma position with these options that are short dated, and this stock can run 100 points or 150 points pretty easily. Anyway, 
Douglas said something that made a lot of sense. He said, essentially, what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. And I think that's what's happening with the GME. If I'm long 400 shares of Lab D and I've got a stop for 200 shares and a limit for 200 shares, take profits, right? And a stop, trailing stop to stop me out, then it's pretty simple. I don't do anything because all the orders are in. But then if I'm long puts on GME and then long the stock and the, or trying to lay in or whatever, I don't really have a, a, a fully baked plan, if that's a phrase. I've heard of half baked. Is fully baked a word? Anyway, but like he says, like Douglas says, essentially what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. I was looking around to see what I did with it. I was reading Douglas earlier today when I was working on this presentation, and uh, I, I'm reading The Disciplined Trader again. It's a very good book, and I have a tape around here somewhere, literally a cassette tape from one of the Tellrate seminars. It's probably 30 years old, and I got a lot from that tape. I almost transcribed the whole tape, and uh, I think the next quote comes from that tape. If you can put on a trade without hesitation, take it off without emotional discomfort, you have accepted that risk. Well, who cares if I'm putting on 200 to 400 shares in one particular account of LabD or SOXS or SQQQ or whatever it may be, or small size in the futures? Who cares, you know? And what I do, again, is I've learned to, you know, post pre-COVID, I think I tried to, to be a little cute with my trading. And, and as I talked about before, Last year, I, I got a little too aggressive and, and because I was doing so well, okay, but it was working so well, said no trader ever, right? So I kind of stepped on the gas, and before you knew it, I started trading myself into a hole. Well, after COVID, it's, it's like coming down on my share size, not being so full of myself, and life has gotten a lot better. And I think about this Douglas quote all the time. If you could put on a trade without hesitation, take it off without emotional discomfort, you have accepted the risk. Well, this GME kind of woke me up. I probably haven't accepted the risk. <laughs> I don't know how anyone could. Now, one thing you have to do, as psychologists say, is you have to be clinically dispassionate. If you're a psychologist and you get wrapped up in your client's problems, then your emotion begins to take charge and you're not able to see things objectively, okay? And along those lines, the quotes from Larry Williams makes a lot of sense. And this kind of dovetails in with my being flippant. And it's funny, you know, uh, uh, I still drop F-bombs, don't get me wrong. But post-COVID, I don't care about a small loss. It's like, it's like, okay, well, I'm going in. I might lose a little, but who cares, you know? And it's like, I'll get them on the next one. And you know, maybe I'm a little philosophical because the service has been doing well and I've been trading those stocks along with you guys. And then the, most of my ancillary trades, position trades, that is, have been doing fairly well too. But it, it seems like the more flippant I become, not in like not caring about the money management, caring about the money management and making sure those stops are in place and honoring those stops, but just really not caring and let the chips fall where they may, it seems like life has gotten a lot better until today and, and occasionally <laughs> end of the week when I'm messing around with the GME. Sounds like I'm confessing something here. Anyway, Larry Williams once said, to make money as a trader, you have to not care. As soon as you start caring, you have emotional attachment. It's counterintuitive. The more you care, the less you make. The more you're clinically dispassionate and less attached to your trades, the more you will make. It's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. When I was when I came into today, I was super bearish. I'm super bearish going into tomorrow on the semiconductors and biotech. Well, where did I make most of my money today? LABU and LABD. Not a lot, but on the day trades, okay? A, a tiny bit, not enough to brag about because I took really small positions. Well, Dave, those go opposite of what you're saying. I know because I was looking at Lab D this morning and looking at Lab, especially SOS. X, S O X S, and they were dropping like a stone. And I was like, well, if they're going down, then the ups are going up. And it's like, I don't, I don't want to be bullish. And that's not what I, I'm I'm super bearish. But you know what? I'm gonna see if I could just kind of go with the flow 
And as G.C. Selden would say, by the way, uh, G.C. Selden's book, Good Book to Read, Psychology of the Stock Market. Do I have it here? No, I do not. Very good book to read. It's about that big. And, and I've ordered about, it, it gets lost for some reason. I have like six copies laying around my office. And you could actually get it online and read it online because it's in the public domain. But um, I think it's uh, Cosmo, if that's a word, books has republished it. But it's a wonderful little book on trading psychology, and it was probably written 150 years ago, which is pretty amazing. But anyway, long story endless, he talks about subordinating your will to the market. And I kind of felt like I did that today, making a tiny, tiny bit amount of money actually going long, lab you small positions now, and S-O-X-L, as opposed to what I really wanted to do is get aggressive on the short side by buying those inverse shares. So. Anyway, we'll see how that works. Now, flipping is something that, again, I talk about quite often. And by flipping, I mean not just not caring at all, okay, but flip it in the execution of your system. So good traders are flipping in the execution of their system. It is what it is. So what? I know. Ha ha. Easier said than done. And, you know, you don't really care what you're trading. And I've become. As much as I love riots and Mara, I have learned to become a little detached from them. And as I've been saying quite a bit lately, I've been focusing a lot on closed equity. And if I can go in and get an intraday trade on, on Mara and Riot, I get that intraday trade. And then, you know, I get what I get and I don't throw a fit. I think the old Dave would, would get stopped out and say, well, let me just grab another piece and grab another piece and grab another piece. But I kind of don't care. It's kind of like you were kind enough to give me some money today. I will take it. Or you knock me out today. I'm not going to fight to get it back like the old Dave might have done. Okay. <laughs> Admission of guilt. Instead, what I'm going to do is say, well, let's just see what happens. And you know what? I'll live to fight another day. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. As I often say, we could talk about trading psychology too. We're blue in the face, and often I do. And there's so much to cover here, and there's so much to talk about. But the bottom line is, trading like life all boils down to making decisions and living with them. And the living with them is a the hard part. Making a decision is very easy. Living with that decision is more important. And, and you know, not to last week at Van Camp, you, but the COVID thing has me really thinking about, is this trade going to make future Dave mad, okay? And then you have to kind of go through a little bit of a decision ma matrix. So I, remember I just told you that I, if I make a little money in like Riot or Myra, one of my favorite stocks at the moment for the intraday stuff, what I'll do is, is, is you know, used to be at least, I'd make money in it and then I'd feel like I'm lottery rich, so I'm gonna go in again and go it again. Oh, you knocked me out, I'm going back in. And when I am up, let's say I'm up $1,000 or, or on a day or even $500 on a day and on one or both of those stocks, and if I go back in and retrade that stock and at the end of the day I'm down, you know, I'm going to be pretty damn angry. That's future Dave. At the end of the day, it's going to be pretty damn, damn angry at present Dave. So it's like, will that trade, will this present, will present Dave make future Dave angry. And today I got knocked out of one of those at a small profit. And I found myself actually, I actually placed an order to get back in. And I said, well, hang on there, Dave, post COVID Dave, that is, will this trade make future Dave mad or angry? And the flip side is, well, if I can't stand it and I'm willing to live, willing to live with that decision, even if stopped out, then I have to take the trade. But, you know, I got to think, it's like, eh, it's not worth it. Even if it goes up, I'm willing to say, so what? And I think that's part of being flippant. The other thing about being flippant as far as following your system and doing what has to be done is you're glad when your stinkers stop out. Every day I look at my portfolio. I look at it way too much during the day, right? I keep that screen up. And every little tick, I see it go up, down, up, and down, up, and down, up, and down. Well, I get really sick of 
seeing a loser in there or a couple losers in there. In fact, what I did, like I talked about earlier, is I created a watch list for, and I call it chopping block. So stocks in that list, I need to make sure every day I come in and whatever's on the chopping block, I go ahead and put in a hard order on those stops. Now, in some cases, I might put in a trailing stop or whatever. Like if the, if the stop is a point, if my hard stop is a point below the market, I might set a trailing stop for one point. So at least I won't lose more than I intended to lose on that trade. And, you know, there's been a lot of times when these stinkers stop out and I'm actually happy because tomorrow I don't have to come in and look at that particular trade anymore. Yeah, Lauren is saying uh, more trading related. I would really like you to do a Facebook post on how to short those high growth stocks using deep in the money puts as I don't feel super comfortable shorting old high flyers. Well, that's that's the, the dangerous thing is shorting some of these high flyers, but the bigger they are, sometimes the harder they fall. Now, I know I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but a lot of times, you know, when this biotech was a while back was blowing and going i was very leery about shorting biotech but now i'm willing to at least go in and, and do lab d and then the deep in the money thing i was I started to put together a presentation for tonight on that and then i realized that if you go to the members area i talk a lot about deep and the money puts and i can touch upon that tonight and that's something that i have some extra slides in here and we'll see how tonight goes but uh, i would go in and watch the q a because we do talk a lot about deep in the money puts there. And I will talk a little bit about the options tonight. All right, let's take a look at some of these questions before we go. Oh, good. Uh, Lauren from Australia said his folks got the vaccine. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and get it. I don't know how long I have to wait. My doctor warned me, I had one friend that got it soon after he had COVID, and he said the reason we do that is it, that you have the antibodies to fight the vaccine, you know, because the vaccine will make you a little sick from what I understand, and you don't want to wait too long. But I talked to a doctor friend of mine, he says, well, there's a flip side of that is that your your body hasn't fully recovered from the COVID, and then you get hit with the vaccine. But yeah, I would uh, I would like to take it. Uh, but yeah, Lauren, we could certainly we could certainly bring that up. I'm going to show you an options trade in one minute that wasn't actually deep in the money puts on uh, ADI, and I think it's going to help uh, it's going to help you out in that case. So before we get into options, I have a question: how how do you make money trading stocks? Okay, how how do you make money? Now I'm not saying what's your methodology. I'm, I'm talking on just like a basic level, okay? How do you make money trading stocks? George's question is, can you show a chart showing your limit and trailing stop? Uh, yeah, George, I think we have plenty of those examples on um, on the in the Q&A and all, but if we don't, I know I've done it, I think I've done it before at a Trading Simplified show, and I'll see if I can hunt hunt that down remind me in facebook tomorrow all right nobody's answered the question all right i guess i'll answer it for you to make money trading stocks all you have to do is sell higher than you buy or cover lower than you shorted so in other words all you have to do to make money trading stocks or bitcoin or forex or whatever other tradable instrument there is is to capture a price move okay so to sum that up even further, all you have to do is get the price right. I know easier said than done. As I often say, my wife will tell me things like, all you have to do is just tighten that little faucet with a wrench. And then, you know, there goes the, the plumbing for the day. <laughs> now with options, you have to get the price right. And you have to get the time right. As I've said a dozen times or probably a hundred times. Many, many years ago, I was part of a hedge fund for 14 years, and all we traded was options, okay? Now, I, I didn't become an options expert by doing this, but I did learn a little bit through osmosis, and I learned a lot about things like gamma, which I'm going to touch upon in one second, but decided not to get too deep into the weeds on the gamma stuff tonight. But whenever I would say, he's like, okay, where's the market head? It's like, what's going higher? Okay, well, how, how high is it going to go? I'm like, I don't know. You know, as a trend follower, 
you're not a trend predictor, okay? First, you have to have a trend to follow, as Greg Morris has pointed out many times. And then you stay with it as long as it moves in your favor. A lot of times, something as simple as a trailing stop. And excuse me, if you're doing an intraday trade, then you could just put in an automated trailing stop. Or let's say you're trying to exit some shares, or as I've been talking about lately, we've had these really big winners, knock on wood, you know, in the uh, come in, <laughs> in the portfolio. And I've been peeling off a few hundred shares here and there. And I noticed you guys at Facebook doing the same thing. And sometimes you just go in and it, let's say it stops at two points overnight, gaps higher two points. We'll put in a two point trailing stop because you're kind of where you were the day before, worst case scenario, right? And then try to ride the rest of the day to take off a few shares. But anyway, as a trend follower, all you have to do is stick with the position as long as it moves in your favor. But the options, you not only have to get the price movement right, you have to get the timing right. And timing is very, very crucial. And, and crucial. And in many cases, you also have to get the volatility right, okay? I paid a lot of money for some GME puts today, okay? And I flipped out some in and out of a few of them. But I'd probably be embarrassed to show you what I bought and how much I paid, okay? You'd probably be like, oh, wow, that's crazy. What I am hoping, and I know you should never use the word hope, okay, is that I not only get a price move, because it's going to have to be one hell of a price move, but I hope that the volatility increases to a point where these options hold most of their value if the price move isn't quite big enough. Now, one thing that I've said before is... The reason I don't get deep into options, and first of all, I really keep things really, really, really simple, okay? Only go long, I don't do spreads. The only thing that's kind of complicated that I've never done before until now is there's been a couple times where I look at like Riot and Meyer because those are two of my favorite stocks right now. And if the puts are really cheap, let's say tomorrow the puts are really cheap or seem cheap, okay? Based on this little question I have down here, then I might buy the puts and then go along the stock. And then that way, the puts will protect my position. And the most I can lose is, is figure, you know, calculate the price of the puts and whatever the stock movement to make the puts worthwhile to break even, however, how it works, you know. So I have that maximum risk on a piece of paper. Then I could just let the stocks do what they may, especially if I'm bullish on them and bullish on crypto at the time. Now, anyway, the point when it comes to options is if if you know options, you'll likely have your own strong opinions, okay? And if you don't, you might end up getting confused. So options are a big can of worms. One thing that I want to just be completely frank about is that I wouldn't know Black Shoals if it hit me in the ass. And, and guess what, okay? Everybody and their brother or everybody in the world has an option pricing model. What good is that if everybody has it? I do know a story of someone that did have a model. Now he was a brainiac, okay? And he came up with a model that could actually find an inefficiency in the markets. And there was a major brokerage, I'm not gonna say anybody's names here to, to, to throw anybody in the bus, and they offered him a fairly absurd amount of money for his program. And he, the only thing he asked was that they would keep their size within reason. And so the edge would continue to work. Well, within, I don't know if it was days, but it didn't take very long where they, they, they pushed it so hard, the edge came completely out of the market. And if you talk to this gentleman, he said that was a billion dollar mistake selling his options model to these people. So there's one case where you've got, and this is why I'm saying everybody in the brother's got black shoals, okay? This guy had his own little model and, you know, knock yourself out if that's what you want to do. Good luck, you know, or as, you know, like they say in Taken, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it ended badly for that guy, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I was talking to one of you guys last week or week before about options. And I didn't want to sound aloof or anything, like not giving him all his answers. And I said, look, here's the deal. This is the only really question 
from my standpoint that you have to ask yourself. And I'm going to show you a trade that hasn't really worked out yet. It worked out great yesterday. Should have cashed out, right? Should have, could have, would have. <laughs> Said no trader ever. But can the stock move far enough and fast enough to make a purchase of the option worthwhile? And that's the only thing other than is the universe friendly, you really have to ask yourself, right? There it is, can of worms. So here's a trade I took yesterday in ADI. Now, ADI was on the Landry list. It was a bow tie. I like the way it rallied up. And if you're going to buy an option, sometimes you kind of have to anticipate the price movement. Now, if you're going to buy a deep in the money option, let's say you're buying like a 160, okay? Then you can let this thing trigger. And when it triggers, put an alert in or whatever, then you go in and buy your 160. Well, I was kind of anticipating it on an intraday basis. So it was right around, I think, 150 or so. We'll take a look at the actual price here in one second. And those options were only two bucks or 220, I think is what they were. And I got to thinking, this stock, if this stock begins to crack, even though it's a short dated option, right? And even if I was going to day trade this stock, I would have to at least use a two point stop, right? So I went ahead and, and bought the options. Now I'll show you where I bought them. I bought them right around there somewhere when it was breaking down on an intraday basis, okay? And you could see this is like a point and a half above. So this is a point and a half move or two point move already. And the options were only 220. And I, I thought they were cheap at that. Now, somebody could bring up Black Shoals and say, oh, they're not cheap and blah, 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 blah. And what I immediately do is I put in a limit order to flip out half of the option position to get a free position. As I've preached before, the secret to trading, if there is one, is free positions or free rolling, as we now call it. Okay, you get that swing trade out, you got your stop to break even, kind of like we have an ARL, ARLP right now. It's just, you know, it's kind of just treading water, but maybe that stock will take off. And if it does, we're still there. If it doesn't, barring overnight gaps, we'll scratch out of the remainder. And then you go in and look at the portfolio, there's some huge winners in there. ASO, CLB, CPE, and then maybe MESA, MESA, hit that initial profit target within three days, okay? Got a little ahead of itself, kind of backed off a little today, but that's another free position, and maybe, just maybe, we, we, we can capitalize on that. Now, I didn't get my free position yesterday. The option didn't move far enough, or the price didn't move far enough and fast enough to have my limit order get hit on half of those options. So I come in today and my equity stinks based on this position because the stock rallied back up and all that paper imaginary profit I had evaporated. But let's just see what happens tomorrow with this. And then, you know what? If I lose, I lose. I'm going to lose a lot less than if I would have shorted this position outright. And then I just say, well, so what? You know, maybe I'll get them next time. But that's just to answer your question, uh, Lauren, quickly. This is how I played ADI. And what I'd recommend you do is start at the money, okay, when you're looking at options. Now, obviously, if you're trying to get a position trade off, you might want to look a little bit further out than a few days. But that gamma, which is rate of change of delta, I don't know, kind of, I don't want to get caught up in the Greeks too much. But if you have an option, let's say an at the money option, it has a delta of 50, meaning that if the stock goes up a point, it's a put, It'll the option will go down 50 cents. If the stock goes down a point, the stock, the option will go up 50, 50 cents. But what happens is as that option gets further into the money, that, that delta, how many shares you're or short, so to speak, or, or, or you put shares, whatever, will go up very, very quickly. There's an old option saying, gamma gets you. You'd never want to be short gamma. You don't want to come in and say, oh, these options are getting ready to expire. Let me just sell some and put some money in my account, make some income. Well, that'll work until it don't. Great way, great way to have a very brilliant but brief career. So options versus outright stock. Determine where your stop would be, should go on the actual stock, okay? Like I said earlier, the ADI would be at least two points away, okay? For example, if suppose you're thinking about stock with a two-point stop, and with ADI, it would be much more than two points, right? If there are options trading for around two points and you think the stock could easily move enough to make trading an option worthwhile before it expires, there's a caveat, right? Then buy the option versus the actual stock, okay? 
I don't know how many times I've tried this little gamma play like this and it's failed and because because it's such a small position I sweep it under the rug and then I come in on Monday and the, the stock gaps down 20 points okay and then then I drop an f-bomb okay I got my f-bomb here tonight I'll drop this and it makes a lot of noise there it there it is f there you go all right Now, the other thing, as I said a second ago, I got a little ahead of myself. I, I would recommend selling half on a double. Let's say you got 10 options at a buck for a thousand bucks. I always almost immediately put in an order to sell half of those options at a double. OK, and that way I got a free position. Then I could manage that position. OK. And then, you know, somebody was asking me about a stop on an option. It's like it's something that I don't think I would do. But what you could do, and it's going to complicate things a little bit, but you could put a trailing stop on the stock to negate, like say a stock's running, you could put a trailing stock stop on the stock to negate your options as and try to stay with that stock as long as possible and stay with your options. So hopefully it didn't confuse you with that. That might be something we have to flesh out uh, through Facebook or somewhere else. And I know it's easier said than done, but you kind of get the idea. Okay. One thing I would recommend you do, and all, nearly all, I should say, there's some, there's a couple things outside the methodology, and then some IPO stuff every now and then. Not all IPOs, but every now and then, some IPOs will set up with like a buy a B or something, and, and those aren't the service. But sometimes we mention them in Facebook first. But my goal is to not show you anything here that I haven't already shown ahead of time. For instance. Like in the stock chart show, I show the mystery chart. Well, that's the most of those. In fact, I think all of them so far have come straight from my trading service. Okay. But I review the archives. It's DaveLander.com slash archives. And then if you're if you're new to the trading service, we've got a lot of new people to the trading service. By the way, from the members homepage, there's DaveLander.com. That's the public site. Okay. The member site, members only site is daylander.com slash members. Just click on trading service and there's also a direct link to the service. By the way, those on the service, I was gonna bring this up tomorrow on Facebook. Um, would you want an email every night to let you know when the service is live or is this just gonna be one more email in your inbox? And it's okay to say no because it's one more thing I'd have to do and, and probably would forget it half the time. <laughs> but um, anyway. So if you do the service before forget, come down here and look at the last several weeks to see what's going on. And one thing that I probably need to do a show on fairly soon is the portfolio ebb and flow. And even though I'm kind of bearish now, we we don't exit bearish. I guess bearish in some way, bearish on certain sectors, right? Because the market's making new highs, as you'll see in one second. But we don't exit all the stocks as soon as things turn sour in the market a little bit we stick with them just in case they keep running and again knock on wood man uh <laughs> knock on wood we've had a few of these stocks continue to defy gravity because we're in energies and metals and mining and now transports are running and we're in an airline believe it or not i know an airline <laughs> 45 to 2 short to long yeah tonight thank you craig i'm glad you counted uh tonight no email necessary fine that yeah that's great that's fine with me okay um tonight i had 45 potential shorts and two potential longs on the trading service and then from those i selected uh two of my favorite shorts and then three of my next favorite shorts as ancillary type of setups which i'm going to be looking at tomorrow and I know that's a big list to manage, but you, there were hundreds, there were hundreds of shorts tonight, and I whittled it down to that. And, and the reason I left a lot of those in there and didn't whittle any further is I wanted you to see how many they were, I wanted you to see what sectors they were in, and in some cases, I know you guys like to go in and, and do your own um, trading. Yeah, you know, yeah, no kidding, Craig. Uh, one thing I often preach about, and it'll probably be fodder for next week's show, maybe next week's show is going to be written for me is that the database speaks and it pays to listen. And like I said in last night's service or the night before, I forget, check the archives. 
I have a client that has pointed out whenever I have a plethora of sell signals or sh potential shorts in the database, the market usually cracks within a few days. And he gave me an example of when that happened recently. So yeah, I think so. And then that makes a lot of sense because back when I was running, I, I, for fun, I ran a list called the Landry 100. And it was a lot of, it wasn't a lot of work, but it was one more thing I had to do and I wasn't getting compensated for it. And I wasn't gonna rush out and trade a hundred stocks. You know, it's like my, I guess my fantasy was to someday um, have a hedge fund pick it up or whatever. And I did have a hedge fund manager or I guess he's a money manager, want to trade the list, but we never did, we never were able to get it launched for whatever reason. And anyway, the, the thing about that list was, it was a wonderful exercise. I ran it for two or three years. And in a runaway momentum market, it would absolutely print money. But then every now and then it would get whacked. And I'm talking about like a 4% whack. And and you know maybe the the hedge fund guy couldn't take that occasional four or five percent whack this this thing would get you know at least three or four percent maybe five or more on occasion. But when we get whacked, you can almost start your start your countdown clock. The market was soon to follow, and maybe that's what my with the client I talked about earlier is seeing the Landry list when there's a plethora of shorts. And one of you guys says, uh, "Thank you for using the word plethora. It means a lot." When there's a plethora of shorts, usually the market tanks shortly thereafter. So will the market tank? I don't know. Am I interviewing myself? I don't know. <laughs> Can we see an example of the, a live example of the options, okay? Actual stock with the option you would buy instead. Um, well, with that ADI, uh, if you go back in and, and look at the recording of this, uh, Harry, with the ADI, the stock was somewhere around 150, and an at the money 150 was trading at about 220 on the ask, okay? And I just felt like it was worth 220 to buy that option on Wednesday. I had three full days or two and a half at least full days are um, between now and expiration. And, I, and I'm waiting for the, the semis to crack. They haven't cracked yet. They sure look like they're ready to crack. And you know what? I, I hope I hope the semis go straight up. I don't care if I lose them at one position. I'll just go long and I'd, I'd much rather go long and not have to buy the short side. But, you know, I'm flipping, you know, now at least, especially post COVID. And even though I've got the strong opinions to the downside, hey, if they're going up, they're going up, you know. Gary Kaltbaum once said, give me an uptrend, give me a downtrend, or give me a ticket to Tahiti. And, and Gary's right, a brother from another mother. Also, the F U N G U stocks are a gouge, a huge part of. You said a gauge. I guess you said a huge part of the S&P. Interesting. Okay. Well, I was kind of, I was the other night, uh, FNGD, I got this, see, I got, you know, I, I don't always practice what I preach. I saw FNG, FNGD breaking out in after hours and I went ahead and bought some and I failed miserably on that position. <laughs> Somebody asked me the next day to explain it to them and I'm like, no, you don't want to. No, you don't, Danny. I lost my butt on that one. I got a little bit ahead of myself, maybe a little full of myself. Okay. All right, we're going to hop into the live charts now. Um, if you're watching this on Facebook, number one, if you like it, then like it, okay? And if you don't like it, then go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> Half kidding. And also subscribe to my channel. And I'll put a link uh, in the recording of this to the channel, Dave, youtube.com slash C slash Dave Landry. I would encourage you to join the members area, all the stuff we talked about with options in a lot more detail or behind the firewall. And I guarantee you, if you get up to speed, you know, in the, if you get up to speed and go through all the members courses and go through all the Q&A and then come ask questions in the Facebook group, I guarantee you, we can put you in the right track. And if you're willing to be become a gold member at least, okay? And if you're willing to follow along and do what I say, and, and I don't always do what I say, right? But follow along and do what I say. I would imagine over, it's gonna take a little time, over six to eight months though, you should be able to become profitable as a trader and you should be able to get better and better. And by the way, one thing I've noticed with trading as many many years ago i worked closely with a trader and my job was to help him 
pit stops. And, and initially I would run the scans and presenting with the scans and everything. And what happened was during the process, which took 45 minutes back then, okay, to run scans. Now it runs instantly within, you know, two seconds or whatever, or you don't even, you don't even notice it when you run a scan. But anyway, what I would do back then is I would just start going through a couple thousand stocks because I, I had nothing to do for 45 minutes while the scans were running. And, and that's how I got to looking at a lot of charts and everything. And then I found that after a while, I began to get better and better and better. But anyway, the point I was trying to make with the story, got a little sidetracked. Imagine that, me getting sidetracked. The point I'm trying to make is that what amazed me was this guy had been trading for years and he was a good trader. And over the course of about six months, while I was really going through this intense learning how to read charts, period, he got better and better and better and better and better and better. And it was just amazing to see somebody who's been at this so long get better. And that's the thing that's amazing with this business is that if you stick with it and you get your trading psychology right, and that's the hard part, believe me, you'll you'll do really, 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 really well. And you know, getting back to the gold member. I, I truly believe everything is in there you need. The premium courses will be unlocked with time. There's, there's a few little gems in those premium courses. But for the most part, I think it's worth your while. So anyway, let me hop into the charts. And while I'm getting the charts up and running and shift gears, you guys who start asking about individual stocks or anything else, let's take a look at the overall market. And... Let's drill down a few things. Now, as I just told my service peeps, if all you showed me was the S&P 500 and the Rusty and you know the NASDAQ to some extent, but especially the S&P 500 and the Rusty, I would say, man, this market is doing fantastic. You know, look at it, look at the massive P's. You know, as Tony Elvis would say, they're huge. I mean, they were up, what, a percent today? Close at all time highs. Not gonna argue with that, okay? Bow time moving averages, try to roll over, nope. Do over, straight back to all-time odds. That looks fantastic, right? Take a look at NASDAQ, okay? NASDAQ is a little bit more questionable. If you take the bow ties out and look at it from more like a first thrust standpoint, okay? This is a pretty deep retracement here, and it could actually go much deeper. I think the NASDAQ could go well above whatever that is and still be in a lot of trouble. I think you can go... You can go above 13.7. I'm just pulling a number out the air, but somewhere in 13.7 or so. And then it would still be in a lot of trouble. So NASDAQ looks questionable at best to me. Now let's take a look at some sectors. Okay, look at energies banging out new highs. Metals and mining banging out new highs with vigor. Banks are at new highs, insurance, real estate's kind of hanging in there just off of all time highs. And Take a look at like the transports, okay? Transports are doing good, doing well. Banging out brand new highs with vigor. Take a look at drugs, not so hot, okay? Let's put the bow ties in there. And as you can see, they've bow tied down. They sold off out the bow tie and now they're retracing back up. Take a look at biotech, okay? Another area, first thrust down, a little bit of a rally and then bam, imploded. And now it's setting up again for a new leg lower, potentially a new leg lower. Obviously, I don't know that for a fact. Health services, mostly sideways, but somewhat dubious. Manufacturing, just off of all-time highs. That looks pretty good. Leisure's looking good, right at brand new highs. And no, that's leisure, okay? And what else? So there's a few other areas that are looking pretty darn good, but then look at retail, okay? Retail sold off hard out of a bow tie. And by the way, I was telling my service peeps this earlier, this is why shorting is tough because you nail this bow tie here, you capture this huge move lower, and you're trying to trail your stops and ride that stock lower, okay? And then what happens? You have the sharp retrace rally, and then of course, after you get knocked out, the market implodes. But retail looks poised to make a new leg lower. Yeah, George, I'm glad you brought up TAN. TAN looks like it's in a lot of trouble. I had TAN puts last week. I played a little gamma play there and did okay. Somebody's like, what's tan puts? <laughs> you know, never heard of tan puts. Is that like orange puts? I'm like, no, tan, T-A-N, the E-T-F. <laughs> but anyway, same sort of pattern there kind of resembles what we were just looking at, uh, retail, you know, where you got the bow tie, beautiful textbook bow tie implodes from that, and then it makes a sharp retrace back up. The semiconductors, I'm probably most bearish on the semiconductors. And if you look at tonight's Landry list, which I'll make public, I guess, next week i'll make that public so you guys can go in and look 
who aren't, who aren't on the trading service. Um, by the way, I'm getting a lot of confusion from, from new guys, and I guess because I set everything up and I know where everything is. Uh, the trading service, it says trading service on the member's dashboard, okay? And somebody said that little buy is confusing, like you got to buy it. It's actually a buy on the chart, okay? And if not, there's a direct link I can maybe post somewhere. Can I ask a question? No, I can't. I can put it in the Q&A here. Anyway, it's uh, DaveLander.com slash core trading service. Uh, let's see. How do I put text in here? I forget. It's been so long, I forget. The T? Oh, oh well. Anyway, there's a direct link to it. And I'll, um, if anybody needs a direct link, just let me know. I'll put it in the comment section below on YouTube. So anyway, again, I have a plethora of shorts. A lot of them are in the semis. All right, uh, let's go ahead and open up for individual stock picks, individual or any other things you guys want to talk about. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Craig. www.davelander.com slash core trading service. George, uh, that stock is a recommendation for tomorrow as a short, so I can't, I can't cover it after out of respect to my people. But uh, good eye and high five, and uh, put all the grandkids and kids' college funds into that one. Actually, it hasn't triggered yet. So, thank you, Craig. Where's Don? F is moving. <laughs> Yeah, I, I probably kicked him up, uh, kicked him out a lot. Yeah, now it's trending. Okay, that's funny. <laughs> we had a guy named Don would come in all the time, and he'd ask about Ford, and he'd ask about it like when it was like a sh going straight down or just chopping sideways. But look at that. Look at that. Look at that tree. It's huge. Where's Don when you need him? Hey, Don, Ford's going up. I used to, have to kick him. Out. I used to have to kick him out of the uh, the group. <laughs> Form, F O F O R M. F or M. Yeah, that looks like a stock that's in trouble. You know, the only thing I'm noticing is that it, it's got close to half a million shares. It might be liquid enough to short. I prefer, you know, like the ADI, that's the kind of stock I prefer shorting. You know, you've got, what's that, 30 million? One, two, three. I wish they'd put the, I think the new version of volume is different, but it's 30 million shares a day. So I know a lot of institutions own this. A lot of people own it. This is an efficient stock for the most part, but it can make an inefficient move, okay, when it begins to crack because it's it's a crowded, it's a is that I think the term is it's a crowded trade. There's a lot of people that are likely in it. Double top, bow tie, looks like a pretty good short, okay. Mark says, thank you as always. Glad you are alive and healthy. Yeah, I'm like a live big time, you know, and uh I, I wish I could turn my camera and show you where I am so far with the with the setup in here. I got a temporary setup with uh, three monitors. I need to try to add a fourth one this weekend. And I've got two monitors in front of me now, and maybe even a fifth one might be coming in. <laughs> Who knows? I've been a little nuts lately. But yeah, I'm building a uh, building a desk like I said last week, and I'm excited about that. And I've been ordering these exotic woods, and it's it's uh, it's going to be crazy. Rockstar, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah like my wife says you can write a book but you can't remember to take out the garbage that's a good thing about um that's a good thing about um having a wife keeps you humble right i do have a stationary bike i um I have a peloton i need to get back on it though i mean i'm i need to i'm, I'm hurting since since uh since COVID. like i think i said in the stock chart show i chopped down a little tree and uh, I was pretty much spent for the day after that. But uh, yeah, I need to get back on the Peloton. But yeah, I'm on fire. I'm just excited and uh, still a little tired here and there. You know, some strange things like I'm craving sugar for some reason since uh, since that. My wife still never got rid of her headache. My headache st stuck with me for like a uh, couple of weeks. Mark Fitch, teenager. Okay, anybody else? Going once, going twice. FNGD is a bow tie up. Yeah, yeah, you know, 
The only problem with, with these levered shares, it's not quite a bow tie, but yeah, I'm bullish here. And you know, here's the thing you got to be careful with. You would think, okay, well, let me just buy this on a flyer. It's 346, it's cheap, you know, who cares, you know? But the problem is they'll reverse split you to death. Okay, let me see if there's a way to, I forget how to do it. Is there a way to show an adjuster for splits? I can never find these things. Uh, edit and uh, prices uh, somewhere in here. You can show unadjusted for splits. Well, just take my word on it. They'll reverse split you to death. So, and the other thing is, with your with your long and inverse share, especially if it's leveraged, the way the math works is what happens is if it begins a rally, they have to they have to short more and and it ends up being like a martingale thing and with that and slippage they eventually all go to zero and then they keep reverse splitting them over and over again uh let's see i wish there's a way to let's take a look at them like a quarterly on this yeah see what i mean they eventually all go to zero okay it was up at 337 it'll probably eventually go to zero but every time it gets near zero they're gonna re reverse split it okay so yeah, don't hold on to it forever. And you can't short an inverse share. I've tried before. Um, I know it's kind of crazy, but if you could short them, then that would actually be a pretty good play it, because eventually you would you would make money. Eventually it could be a long time. Uh, max time frame. I don't, I don't, I, you know, I've accidentally, I've done this a couple of times lately. I got to watch myself. It's one thing COVID has blessed me with is a little bit less focus in certain areas. And one thing that I have done lately, I've done it two or three times, and luckily the market gods let me off the hook, but I have took them home. Usually I don't take them home. I won't take, in fact, I won't take them home. You know, um, the other night I bought early, that was a mistake. But I mean, look at this little opening gap reversal here. How textbook is that? You got a thrust from lows. This thing closes on its butt, little opening gap reversal. That's a nice little trade right there. You know, like nice little intraday trade, okay? Ecom. But yeah, tomorrow, you know, if this thing gaps lower and starts rallying or even just starts rallying, period, look for an intraday trade there. Take a look at SOX S. I got long at the end of the day and I think I scratched out. But, you know, keep an eye on this. Keep an eye on this. The, yesterday is when I made my money on the SOX, I think, if memory serves, on this little opening gap reversal higher, okay? But not today. But I actually, I actually picked up a little bit SOX L just because it was going up, you know? Where the money is. Ecom. Let's take a look at the bow ties. Um, you know, there's a if anything, it's a short, but look at the um look at the volume, Craig. You know, I think there's there's what do you say, 42 other shorts out there, 45 other shorts out there that I like better. And take a look at those ones in my ancillary list tonight. I like those a little better. But yeah, I think that's a stock that's in trouble. You, you think about going long. It almost looks more of a long than a short now, but if it stalled out just a little bit, it would look like a short. Yeah, I would I would leave that alone. All right, any more? Anybody else going once, going twice? We usually want to think, oh, Adam, you always do that to me. Okay, I'll wait. <laughs> yeah, that one looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Um, the only thing I would say is I would prefer, it, it's already come down a lot. Here we have a we have a potential. No, it's okay, George. I'm just teasing. We have a potential here to capture the mother of all trends. Okay, so take a look at like ADI, and let's back this out. The the your the big money on the on the short side is on that first crack lower after the first crack lower. Okay, so that first crack after a bow tie, right? So if this thing begins to implode. That's where the money is, catching this big picture rollover, okay? And then go through all the ones on the Landry list for tomorrow and notice they're all at high levels as opposed to extended trends. Now, God forbid we get into a longer term bear market, then we'll start going after stocks that are in longer term downtrends on pullbacks like we normally do with the core methodology on long side, okay? All right, last time, going once, going twice. I know you guys, you're going to mess with me, aren't you? 
All right. I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, bring it up in Facebook. If you want to talk privately, obviously, you can shoot me an email. Everybody have a fantastic night. And if I'll talk uh, soon to you guys, I will uh, uh, have a good weekend is what I'm trying to say, I think. Thank you. You're welcome, George. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it, man.